Oh, hello there. Didn't see you come in. Today's video is going to be a collaboration with some YouTube friends. The video order will be decided by spinning a wheel, and the topic begins with the letter H. Arcades in the 80s and 90s. What were your experiences when growing up? I'll be the MC today, so let's get cracking. First up today will be Wicked Gamer and Collector. He's well known for being a masochist when it comes from collecting packages from China. I mean, if there's a product on AliExpress, he's sure to have covered it. Outside the questionable handhelds, he covers products from Sega, Sony, and became to many a gateway drug to the Pandora's box. Here is the Wicked Gamer and Collector. Hey buddy, thank you for having me here on the channel. I think that a lot of people maybe don't even realize that I grew up with arcade. And that's the reason why I revisit sometimes the arcades, not only here physical, but also when it comes to product reviews. Fun story, my first video I ever uploaded to my channel was related to me playing an arcade game. And that's basically the idea I wanted to do. But I basically moved into like reviewing stuff and you can see it on my channel. I reviewed all kinds of products, think about mini arcade machine, full size mini arcade machines. I even visit companies just to show the people here on YouTube and the internet what is out there. What is the new generation of arcade machines? So recently I visited a new arcade and I just wanted to check out what is going on there. But you can see like we still have arcades and I think it's pretty damn cool. And some of the machines are absolutely crazy. But they're also going to get into the virtual stuff. And not the virtual pinball, I mean like the virtual like where you're putting the glasses on. And bring this virtual reality to the next level with complete crazy machines where you can basically like stand in and just move around. But when I'm getting into, let's say, an arcade, the first thing I'm basically going to search for are pinball machines because I love pinball, especially if you're going to play them unlimited, where you go to an arcade and can play for a certain amount of hours for a certain amount of money. And that is something I personally like. So I go into the pinball machines and just see if I can find a cool pinball machine to spend a couple of hours on. Because, yeah, I'm a pinball freak. Besides pinball, another thing I really love to do is having some fun with friends with the air hockey table. One of the things that never gets bored for me. It's so much fun to play, so basic. But I can tell you that it's going to be quite challenging sometimes when we're playing against a friend of mine. Because some of them are pretty damn good in this game. In the future, I wanted to visit more like new generation arcades. And the new generation have also new generation machines. And they are like pretty damn... I wouldn't say always like bad, they're quite interesting, but some very strange things that you can find like No Deal or Deal or some familiar like Android games they slapped into an arcade machine. I can really appreciate it to be honest. But when you're looking into arcades, there are so many crazy ways to play. If it's a pachinko machine, if you're going to look into like getting yourself an own arcade stick, getting yourself like an arcade machine, get an original one, build yourself one, if you're going to buy a new generation one. So in the end, there are so many ways to play. And if you like arcades like me, there are so much stuff you can get. My interest after all those years has never been vanished away. Let me know in the comments what you like and I want to thank you. Pandori team for having me here on the show. It's awesome to tell you my story, but also show you my quick vision about arcades nowadays. What you can basically find in the arcade, but also what you can buy. Because it's absolutely crazy if you think about it. It's all a bit crazy, isn't it, Wicked? Anyway, back to the spinner. Next up is... Retro Game Corps. In my opinion, his channel is number one when it comes to emulation handhelds. If something new is released, he'll get it. They want to know everything there is to know about it. He's second to none when it comes to making guides, turning complicated jargon into bite-sized chunks. Here is Retro Game Corps. Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Corps. So Emi Chicken over at Team Mandori asked me to talk a little bit about my experience with arcade gaming growing up. And honestly, I've got a ton of different stories that I could tell, but we're going to focus on just one today, and that is the BNI. Now, I grew up in Washington State, and my dad is originally from a town called Tacoma. And every once in a while, we would go and visit his mom, and when we were there, we would stop by this mall called the BNI. Now, I don't know a ton about the history of the BNI, but I know it's been around forever, I think from the 1950s. And you may have actually heard of it because one of its main attractions was Ivan the Gorilla. You may have heard of him through the book and movie that came out over the past few years. And so yeah, as a kid, me and my brothers, we used to go and see Ivan the Gorilla. It was kind of sad to see him in that big glass kind of cage that he was in, but it was also kind of cool the way he would like paint things and things like that. But believe it or not, that was not the most important thing to us at the BNI for me and my three brothers. There were two main places we liked to go. Number one was a sports card store. I remember getting a Ken Griffey rookie card from around that same time. Now, of course, number two on that list was an arcade. And this arcade was incredible. It was super huge 
huge. I'm not really sure what the name of it was, but man, I saw so many new games come out of that place. We probably went there from the late 80s to early 90s, and so we saw everything. For example, I remember seeing the widescreen version of the X-Men arcade game. That thing was incredible. And probably most important to my kind of formative years was that I saw Mortal Kombat for the first time there. Now, I had already seen Street Fighter 2, and that game had blown me away. But you can imagine it being about 11 or 12 years, seeing somebody's head get pulled off was incredible. And so I always have fond memories of Mortal Kombat from the BNI Arcade in particular. But there were a bunch of other games that I saw for the first time as well. I remember seeing Super Off-Road and Saturday Night Slam Masters too. Anyway, it was just a super awesome time to be a kid because every time we went to the BNI, we saw a new game and it always blew me away. Now, in addition to talking about my favorite arcade games, Emu Chicken challenged me to put my money where my mouth is. And so he challenged me to a game I've never played before, and we're gonna see who can do the best. Now I bet he's been practicing, and honestly I've seen his footage, he is way better at arcade games than me, so I'm about to get creamed. Either way, I'm gonna do the best I can, and I'll send the footage over to Emu Chicken, and we'll see how we do. Anyway, thanks for listening to my little story about arcade gaming, and if you wanna hear more, you can check out my channel, which is Retro Game Core. I specifically focus on retro game emulation when it comes to handheld devices. And thanks to everyone over at Team Pandora for having me on, and we'll see you next time. Happy gaming. Thanks, Russ. To the spinner. And it's Shao Style, also known as Joe the Editor. His channel is a great resource when it comes to video editing, and it's usually done with a cup of coffee and a friendly face. He's the video editor at Paul's Hardware, and on his downtime, he does game streaming, play the guitar, and host an online book club. Please welcome Joe the Editor. So yeah, my experience growing up in the 80s. So uh, yeah, I'm 40 years old and like uh, actually my dad, he actually got an, At an Atari. So I did grow up playing uh, with an Atari back in the day. Um, and I had a box load of old games. Somehow he ended up getting them. I'm not sure how he got it to be honest, right? But um, yeah, I did grow up playing Atari and then we ended up getting a Nintendo down the line, right? So then when I started to like play uh, games at um, arcades, my experience was basically, wow, this is cool because obviously the technology built into an arcade was better than like the consoles that you had at home. So visually the graphics were fun, right? Also, um, the thing I remember about arcades is also like the environment of it, right? I grew up in a neighborhood that was like near uh, downtown Disney. Well, actually before it became downtown Disney, it was actually a Disneyland hotel, right? And uh, you were able to walk across the street from it, from where I lived, and like they actually had like an underground arcade that was underwater, right? They had like a little like a pond area. My favorite games, honestly, were always like uh, your standard beat em up, right? Like Ninja Turtles. <laughs> I really liked that game a lot. I always played with Donatello. Uh, that was fun, especially when you had four people playing at the same time. All you had to do was this. Total button smasher, right? But uh, that's the point of it. And it just it looked cool, right? And like, uh, because you're, you're familiar with the storyline, it was just fun, you know, playing against those characters that you grew up watching in the cartoons, right? Also, like, you know, certain games that were, like, uh, pretty violent, say, like, Mortal Kombat, when the first one came out. A donut shop, I remember that uh, they had that. I was near my school. Definitely wasn't experienced, like, uh, playing around with arcades. Being a kid and, like, you know, say they take you to Chuck E. Cheese and your dad gives you a $5 bill, you know. <laughs> Hearing that sound, that ching 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 a bunch of quarters and tokens coming out of the machine out of a $5 bill, you thought you were rich, you're like, you're right. You know, just you had a blast, right? So, yeah, arcades is definitely uh, a good part of my childhood. But uh, the cool thing about arcades that I go to today, uh, obviously, they're all mainly bar arcades, right? And, you know, as you go to, like, nice breweries, they have, like, the pinballs. My girlfriend likes pinball machines big time, right? So, yeah, it's a lot of fun. What I prefer to play the most when I do go to an arcade, along with a, a nice cold beer, I like shooting games, right? Like Time Crisis. Uh, they have this one game they played and it's like aliens, right? You can shoot, you can actually feel like the recoil, you know, the magazine to reload it and you can shoot rockets. It, yeah, it's fun. Definitely like uh, the overall quality of our case has improved, right? I, looked, I do like going to like VR rooms and stuff like that. So to this day still, I do like going to arcades, you know, the bar arcades, you know. I just go have a nice beer, you know, go with my girlfriend or some friends and... You know, they usually have a DJ playing in the background, you know, depending where you go. Yeah, it's fun, right? Going with, like, a group of friends to a specific location to play a specific, you know, game, say, like, Street Fighter or, you know, Mortal Kombat, you know. That's definitely stuck in my head. <laughs> That's for sure. Thank you, Joe. Next up is... Video Game Esoterica. If you're into arcades at all, this channel is banging. It's like a therapeutic yoga session, and the teacher is obsessed with obscure arcade games. Neo Geo 64, Taito Type-X. 
Konami Viper. If you want to know about the hardware as well as the games, this is a place to go. Take it away, Video Game Esoterica. Hey everybody, welcome back to Video Game Esoterica, or in this instance, Video Game Esoterica section of this compilation video. And I was asked to describe my history with arcade gaming and why I got into collecting. And I do collect some of the rarest and most obscure arcade boards around, in some instances one of a kind items in the world. But I did not start out that way, oh no, as a kid, I love the common stuff because I grew up in a small town in Vermont and I found a photo of the mall I used to go to. Right to the left of that blue mall sign was the Dream Machine. It was the only arcade in town and when the mall shut down, there were no arcades in town. It was a tiny place with the games that you would typically see, but my father would bring me there and we would spend quarters on different machines and holy hell when I tell you as a kid that was a memory that I would never forget, I can still see the weird carpet in that arcade. When I mean I grew up in a small town, I mean our state for a while had more cows than it did human beings. We have since usurped the cows place of power and we now outnumber them. But I remember growing up specifically playing Dungeons and Dragons Tower of Doom in the Dream Machine and I fell in love with it. I'd never seen anything quite like it. I would go back and spend all of my allowance money just to play this game. But as usual, time goes on. I graduated high school and I took a little circuitous route to becoming an adult with a college degree because I was into skiing. And what did I do? I stopped playing video games for a very long time, and I started making ski films. I did this for seven years. I was an international team and brand manager at Burton. I've been a coach at the Olympics. I've been a coach at the X Games. So basically for a really long time, I forgot about video games entirely until one time I was at the US Free Skiing Open in Vail, Colorado, staying at a hotel, and I saw a game room and one cabinet intrigued me, and that ended up being Beast Buster's Second Nightmare, a Hyper Neo Geo 64 game. And if you know anything about the Hyper Neo Geo 64, it is stupid rare in the US, and there's really not many cabinets that know when to exist anymore. But when I played this game, I fell in love. So in Vail, Colorado, I remembered how much I liked playing arcade games, and I said to myself that when I stopped traveling and doing skiing for work, that I would one day own a board for this game. Now it's not the first arcade game I bought, it's definitely not the last either, but I do have this in my collection and it's what's reignited my passion for arcade gaming and the rare stuff as well, because I don't really collect that many common things whatsoever. I love collecting the unloved and obscure, the 3D hardware that never made it, the games that are prototypes, the things that you don't usually see, and I show them to people to try to get them excited about it. And that is my history with arcade gaming. Started as a kid, took a big break, worked in skiing professionally, saw Beast Buster Second Nightmare, decided I wanted to own a cab, and now I have one of the largest collections of rare arcade games in the world. Thanks so much for watching, guys. I'm not sure if I'm last, first, or who's next, but I appreciate it, and enjoy. Bye-bye. And thank you for joining. That was great. And I think that's everyone... Ah. Hey, everyone. This is Emi Chicken from Team Pandori. Regarding arcade memories, I'm going to draw it. So I grew up in Northwest England, and my family weren't wealthy. But the thing is, my parents knew how to use their money wisely. Most of the things I owned were used. I mean, every bicycle I had until I was 16 were hand-me-downs from my granddad. At the age of six years old, my dad got me my first computer, an Amstrad CPC 464, with a suitcase of games. I shared this experience with a good friend of mine who lived down the street from me. We both had an Amstrad, and we'd swear that the games were amazing the highest quality imaginable. New Zealand Story, Wonder Boy, Gauntlet 2, they all play great, and in our minds, even Outrun was arcade perfect. A couple of years later, his mum invited me to go on holiday with them, spending a weekend at Bristadin Sands in Wales. And the arcade there blew our minds. Two Crew Dudes, Moonwalker, Robocop, Carrier Airwing, each of them only charging 10p a game, which completely broke our image of the poor Amstrad. As the years went by, I'd eventually get a new Amiga 500 Plus, which had some incredible arcade ports, such as Rodland and Pang, whereas some others, like Outrun, were absolute trash. But the best place to find arcades for us was along Blackpool Front. And they'd gone for miles, but honestly, they were pretty much everywhere in the 90s. Bowling Alley, they had Mortal Kombat, Roundup 5, and Bonanza Brothers. Go-Kart Track, they had Neo Drift Out. And at the swimming pool where my dad worked, they had Snow Bros, Aliens, and New Zealand Story. Later on, we'd go and emulate these games on early Pentium computers, but now, much older, 
I get to own the real deal. Thinking back, the 80s and 90s were a truly magical age when it came to arcades, and these memories I will treasure. On occasion, I still do go to the arcades, but many of the newer games are not very easy to pick up and play. Like this game, you need to collect cards, and for others, the ability to be immune to ridicule. I usually play either shooters or racers, but if possible, I'll try and find an arcade with a section dedicated to the classics. I hope you enjoyed this video collaboration, and this is the third in the series. If you want to check the other videos, there's a playlist at the top, and please be sure to check out the other channels. This has been Emi Chicken from Team Pandori, and I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra! I am John Luke. Sorry I'm late.